Thank you once again. <clears throat> Thank you once again for joining us this morning and this afternoon. We're looking forward to a very interesting discussion on emerging trends in conservatism. We'll uh, be beginning that discussion in about two or three minutes. I wanted to take a moment to ask a favor of the folks in the room. Uh, Future 500 is working to try to find common ground between the traditional right, the traditional left, the new right, the new left. We believe that there is a strong majority of the public that can embrace core principles that we've spoken to today that are core to, uh, to conservatism and that I think are embedded in the Republican Party. Public opinion polls have shown that uh, those core principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, personal responsibility for one's, for one's uh, success, uh, are things that are deeply supported by a strong majority of Americans and a, and a very strong majority of young people, that the millennial generation and the generation after it both have strong allegiance to those, to those principles. But as we indicated earlier, the Republican brand has been badly damaged. And we talked about some of the ways in which, uh, in the political process, the brand has been characterized successfully uh, through campaigns as anti-women, anti-Hispanic, anti-gay, anti-middle class, anti-environment. Clearly, it does not to need to be that, but it's perceived that way to the point that now, according to, again, the, uh, uh, the um, college RNC polling, only about 28% of young voters uh, have a positive attitude toward the Republican Party. Over 50% have a negative attitude toward the Republican Party. It's not that they love the Democratic Party, but, uh, th but the Democrats' numbers are significantly better. And there's a sense that the Democrats get them better than Republicans do. Um, among winnable young voters, as we indicated earlier, the words that often come to mind, these are, these are voters who are basically conservative in outlook, but voted for President Obama in the last election, I think of Republicans as closed-minded, racist, rigid, and old-fashioned. Those are the terms that they, that they uh, come to believe in. So the problem is a problem of branding. And branding is not a, uh, uh, a, a, a thin or symbolic problem. Uh, people that spend their lives building and developing brands, people with the top 100 brands uh, around the world who we work with on a regular basis, understand that a company's brand is not just its packaging, it's not just its logo. A company's brand is its human face, is its human essence. A company's brand is its soul. And if you think about a company's brand, you'll realize that what you're thinking about are human attributes that are applied to particular products and particular, uh, particular companies. That brand is extraordinarily value, uh, valuable. It comprises often more than 50% of the total value of the top 100 companies in the world. If you look at a Coca-Cola, it's something like 70% of the company's value is tied up just in its brand essence, not its intellectual property, not its physical property, just its brand essence, 70% of its value. So it's very useful to look at how brands protect and build their brands if the challenge today is to protect and build the Republican brand. So let me take just a moment to refer to the case of Nike. You may recall that in the mid-1990s, Nike became embroiled in a battle that, uh, uh, that caused significant damage to its brand. It was associated with child labor in the manufacture of soccer balls in Pakistan. And soon, consumer polls were showing that consumers associated Nike with two things, athleticism and bad labor practices. And that association led to a, uh, a topping out of the brand reputation, where instead of being cool and current and, and upbeat and positive, the brand became aged and old-fashioned. And Nike was challenged with 
a continuing decline in its market share from about 55 percent of the market to 39 percent of its market in space of, I think, about seven years or so. Significant downsizing of its, of its market share. Meanwhile, Adidas uh, doubled, more than doubled its market share uh, because it became the more, uh, the more core brand, the more cool current brand. So what did Nike do to, uh, to erase its brand problem? It did two, th two things. First of all, it turned itself around. They stemmed the, the, the blood flow by becoming active on the issue that had made them so vulnerable. They, they became the, the chief champions <laughs> against child labor in the marketplace. They made that something that became embedded with their brand, battling against child labor uh, in, in the third world. They also began to embrace those communities that were important uh, customers of theirs. They embraced women. They became advocates for the idea that women are powerful. Uh, they embraced ethnic minorities as powerful uh, contributors to the cultural and economic vitality of, of uh, the community. They did not uh, become uh, uh, apologists for the victimization of these groups, just the opposite. They didn't say any, any of these people were victims. Certainly were all victimized by circumstances, but none of these people were victims. In the same way, the Republican Party really stands for the idea that people can be victimized, but they are not fundamentally victims, that they can overcome uh, adversity and that they can triumph over adversity. It's important for Republicans to learn from Nike that first, it's important to acknowledge truths that are politically challenging, because while they may lead to co-optation of your issue in the short term, and I, I think that that's exaggerated, they allow you to build a base that's broader. It's important to acknowledge, for example, the culture of, the culture of violence that tends to lead to an almost casual attitude sometimes in response to, to uh, mass violence that is uh, popularized and, uh, and that leads to continual calls for gun control and, and impositions on the Second Amendment that the right doesn't want. If we can't acknowledge a culture of violence, we can't talk about systemic solutions to a culture of violence that don't involve just bringing the government in to impose a heavy hand. Uh, we need to acknowledge that giving government choice and government power over choices that can be made by women uh, is also an escapist approach that doesn't recognize the, the systemic root of the problems. And we need to begin to look at the systemic root of problems that lead people to treat abortion in a casual way, in a, in a mechanistic way that denies the human uh, and moral uh, uh, issues that are, that, are, that are present in that issue. We need to acknowledge the genuine risks that science indicates in areas of climate and environment so that we don't have to accept exaggerated claims and exaggerated uh, urgency uh, and a, uh, 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 an agenda that is fundamentally uh, uh, panic driven to impose central change on the economy. If we can begin to acknowledge those truths and take on those issues at a systemic level, then we have a chance of really attracting a much broader set of the folks who are sympathetic to Republican principles, but that do not consider themselves uh, Republicans at this time. The favor I would like to ask of you is we have this little document that I put together that some of you have picked up, and I would appreciate your responses to it. Uh, it's what the Republican Party can learn from Nike, America's creative entrepreneurial can-do majority and how to win it back. This is a first attempt. It can use plenty of improvement, plenty of crystallization, but it's a first attempt to articulate some traditional Republican beliefs in ways that can draw support from a, a wider community. And we're going to take forward what we learn in today's discussion to revise this. Any input that you can offer will be taken seriously and will result in changes to the document as it evolves. So please pick up a copy of this and please feel encouraged to, uh, to uh, uh, submit your ideas uh, and changes to it so that we can continue to build 
a broader, or at least contribute to building a broader alliance. I would now like to welcome Nick Sorrentino, our representative here in the Washington, D.C. area, to introduce the next session on emerging trends uh, in the conservative movement. Nick? All right, well, thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> I'm Nick Sorrentino. I'm the director of political outreach for the Future 500. Uh, additionally, I'm also the editor of AgainstCarnyCapitalism.org. Um, and I am extremely pleased uh, to have this esteemed panel uh, with us today. Uh, we're going to explore emerging trends in conservatism, uh, how uh, conservatism is changing, uh, how the definition is changing, whether or not it has indeed changed. Um, and I think we're very lucky to have these folks here with us. Um, Steve Bannon is the executive director, is that correct? Exec executive chairman of Breitbart News. Um, powerful organization I think we're all probably familiar with. Uh, Norm Singleton is the Vice President of Policy for Campaign for Liberty, um, a, uh, an organization that is, has grown by leaps and bounds over the past uh, four years, I guess, since it was founded, four or five years. Uh, Lori Sanders, a policy analyst for R Street, uh, great organization that is growing at an exponential rate also, uh, and uh, their work is fantastic. I encourage you to, to look them up. Um, uh, Brittany Moret of the Libre Initiative, uh, they focus on uh, free market issues in uh, the Latino community, uh, how to reach out to that community and why that's important and so on. Uh, and Alice Linehan uh, is the founder of Voices in Power, um, absolutely legit Tea Party grassroots straight from Texas. Um, so uh, we're pleased to have uh, this, you know, a very diverse panel here. Um, and uh, let's just get to it. Um, what I want to do is I want to start with you, Steve. And if you guys just want to, you know, we're talking about emerging trends in conservatism, conservatism. Um, if you could just spend a couple of minutes, I'd like to go down the, the row here and just get your thoughts initially. Well, I, I think we've seen this at, uh, at, uh, at Breitbart. Uh, part of our explosive growth is because we are very focused on a, um, I don't want to say anti-establishment, but we believe that uh, when you talk about brands or you talk about the parties, we don't really believe there is a functional conservative party in this country. We certainly don't think the Republican Party is that. We uh, tend to look at this imperial city of Washington, this boom town, as um, they have two groups or two parties that represent the insider's commercial party. And that is a collection of insider deals, insider transactions, uh, and, a, and a budding aristocracy that has made this the, the wealthiest uh, city in the country. Um, and our focus is on crony capitalism, grassroots support, supporting Tea Party um, uh, folks, and I think you've seen this in the current uh, political environment, whether it is the food stamps bill uh, defeat early in the summer, uh, Ted Cruz's uh, gallant fight with Mike Lee against Obamacare, uh, the entire uh, crony capitalism aspect of the amnesty bill, on and on and on. I think these fights are going to be the new norm. I mean, it's going to be a, it's really an insurgent and a po center-right populist uh, movement that is uh, virulently anti-establishment. Uh, and it's going to continue to hammer uh, the city, both the progressive left and the, uh, and the institutional Republican Party, uh, day in and day out. And I think it's galvanizing, uh, which is really a majority of the people, the working people and middle class in this country, uh, to really have a voice. And so we see that as a huge trend. And I just know from our exponential growth um, that it is something that uh, people are thirsting for out there. So it's a, uh, we can get into more of the details later. but. Everything that we see and every trend that we see is, is very strong to a really an outsider's uh, voice and an outsider's movement to really take their country back. Great. Norm? Um, first, I agree with it, almost everything you said. And uh, I read Breitbart. Uh, it's one of the sites I look at every day. And um, I think Andrew Breitbart had a lot to teach um, conservatives and libertarians on how to be an effective anti-establishment right-wing rabble-rouser. Um, I think that uh, in addition to a very populist um, anti-establishment, anti-establishments of both parties trends, there is a strong, um, much more libertarian um, streak uh, um, to in today's grassroots, in today's what is 
defined as conservatism today, following on the um, Ron Paul campaigns of 08 and 012. I think this year that's been reflected in um, four things. One is, uh, of course, Senator Paul's filibuster against drones, which was an issue that wasn't really on anybody's radar screen until uh, Senator Paul put it there uh, in February or March with his um, filibuster. Secondly, the reaction to NSA, the NSA uh, spying, um, I don't think you would have seen the same reaction even as early as two or three years ago it, during the Obama administration as you did, as you did today. Uh, thirdly is the recent overwhelming reaction, including by many Republicans and many grassroots against the idea of starting yet another war in Syria for uh, undetermined reasons and for an undetermined length of time. And finally, there is the uh, open warfare that seems to have broken out between the establishment and the uh, grassroots over Obamacare. And um, I think what it, what it is is that uh, that is a case where the grassroots is telling the GOP leadership and large sections of the establishment conservative leadership that you've been telling us for since Obamacare passed in 2010, so we're now about, what, three and a half years, that you're going to seriously fight to repeal Obamacare. And I, we, we know Harry Reid controls the Senate and President Obama will never sign the bill. We at least want you to fight and we'll stand with you if you fight and we will not stand with you if you continue to give us lip service. All right. Lori. I'm actually going to take a little bit of a different, a different take from, um, from my colleagues up here. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here, because <laughs> we at R Street always take a different take. Um, but so I think the, the most interesting part of the conversation in conservatism today is sort of the fight between the reform conservatives on one side and the, um, the libertarian populists on the other side. And I think they both have incredibly important things to say, but what I'm really hoping that we will come to is sort of this synthesis that Ross Douthat seems to be constantly pushing us towards you know, in the pages of the New York Times. Um, and I'll tell you why I specifically care about it. I care about it because I care about women voters. I think women voters are a huge problem for the GOP. If you look back, I'm sorry, I'm going to bore you with the numbers that I had to write down or else I wouldn't remember them. Um, but women went for Obama in the last election, 55-44. Before that, they went for Obama, 56-43. In 04, it was 51-48. In 2000, it was 54-44. In 96, it was 54-38. And this is with like Bill Clinton, who was not so nice to the ladies, if we all remember. So I think that paints you know, a really overwhelming trend that is really troubling since women now make up the majority of the electorate. Um, and so while I appreciate the arguments that libertarian populism is bringing out, you know, sort of this, the government is against you, the government has created this unequal opportunity, you know, it's, it's crony capitalism, it's special interests, it's corporations, businesses, the government all coming together, it's bigness in general that we should be skeptical of. I think that that's very, very true. But the solution to that at times to me seems to be something that's untenable, at least for a lot of the less politically engaged women, you know, not the women that are out in the Tea Party, but just the mom who's in the PTA, who's part of her community, who takes her son to Boy Scouts, right? Who really cares about the declining opportunity. I mean, I think it's two thirds of um, parents now think that their children have less opportunity than they will than they had when they were growing up. And, you know, a lot of libertarian populist rhetoric comes out very strong in that, you know, the solution is to get rid of the Department of Education, the solution is to get rid of all of these, you know, massive programs. And, you know, women are more risk averse on average. I'm in no way trying to paint, you know, this terrible picture that, you know, women are these little shrews living in their houses or anything, right? But we understand that personality takes place on a spectrum and women on average tend to have certain types of personality traits more than men. So they are more risk averse. They see things in shades of gray versus in black and white, right? It's a much more nuanced world that women tend to live in. And I think it's somewhat of a scary thing to talk about, we're gonna wind down the Department of Education if you're a mother or if you are you know, someone who's thinking about getting married and having children, which is still what the overwhelming amount of women are thinking about today, even if they're delaying those decisions until later. So what I'm sort of hoping we will come to is a synthesis between the reform conservatives and the libertarian populists, 
what the reform conservatives talk about advocating for the most part, you know, this is Ramesh Panuru, Yuval Levin, these people who are thinking deep thoughts about how we update the Reagan agenda for today's problems. It's things like Mike Lee's tax plan. You know, Mike Lee is frequently associated with libertarian populists, but his tax plan is something that I think both sides could really get on board with. It takes the problems of women, the middle class, and the lower class seriously, and it's not something that's overwhelming and frightening and has, you know, very strong rhetoric. So I'm hoping that we'll sort of see a synthesis between how do we work within the system that we have today to reform it, which is what, you know, the reform conservatives want, and the libertarian populace, who I think would take more of an extreme angle, specifically because I think it's the only way that you can get sort of the less politically inclined women to come over to your side. Important points for sure. Um, Brittany? All right, um, for fear of being a Debbie Downer, I'll try to keep this quick. I think, <laughs> I agree with a lot of what the other panelists said, but I think it's also important to touch on emerging trends that are not helpful to the movement. Um, at Libre, I mainly work with Latino youths, so under the age of 27, um, sometimes black youth, recently immigrated youths. And I think one of the most disturbing trends that I'm seeing growing um, is this tendency to eat our own, the bones and all, in front of each other and in public. And this growing trend of making money off of selling outrage in the public sphere. And that's particularly, it's hurting our image, we're talking about brand, um, with the youth, with these demographics that are growing. By 2050, one third of the adult population in the United States is going to be Hispanic. When nine tenths of the media coming from the right that they see is screaming shamnesty, they're likely to turn off the television or switch to MSNBC. Um, that's just the reality of it. So uh, an emerging trend that I think that we need to address and figure out how to balance our beliefs without watering them down, how to stay true to our principles without backing down from them, is then how do we market that and communicate that in a way that isn't going to end the conversation before it starts. Um, however, so as not to be a complete downer, um, working with the youth that I see all the time, I am seeing an increased distrust of government, which I think there was a poll released not too long ago, maybe it was yesterday, saying that the majority of, of the youths in America have some kind of distrust for the government. Um, and Hispanics start businesses at three times the national average. So you're seeing an, you know, a lot of Hispanics are, are embracing the message of economic freedom if we can get it to them, which is the biggest problem still, that we're not getting our message out into these demographics. Great, uh, Alice? Well, um, I am just a opinionated Texas mom <laughs> who um, has been looking at the, the ground level from a grassroots Tea Party level of, of what's going on, what moms and dads are saying, what, what's going on in education. You know, a lot of these issues that we're talking about that we're trying to figure out why the left owns the narrative on gun rights, um, immigration, um, environmentalism, if you actually look at the curriculum um, of what's being taught to our children in K through 12, um, they're working against us um, during the week when our kids are at school. And so um, as a mom who's been involved in the grassroots, who's been involved in um, empowering people at the local level to be the media to expose what's going on in their own community. Um, we're asking moms and dads to, to go into their schools and say, can I see? Can I see the curriculum? Can I see um, the, the management system that you're using um, to capture data on my child, on their assessments? Um, and looking at these issues at a very local level, I don't believe we're going to elect someone to save us. I think we're going to save ourselves. And the only way to save ourselves is to get educated on the issues and talk about them truthfully and honestly. You know, a lot of these issues for everyday moms and dads who aren't political nuts like us, they can keep their head in the sand, you know, on, on immigration, on transportation, on the budget, because it's not affecting them personally yet. Education is different. When you're dealing with your child who was a straight A student and now through the changes in education um, are coming home 
and you know they're failing or they're disillusioned or they're coming home talking about things that you're completely opposed to, you can't keep your head in the sand. And so I think that this issue of what's going on in education, um, the whole common core philosophy of education, it's just not a, a set of standards. It's a whole philosophy of education we need to take serious and look at. And, and obviously, it's not a left against right issue because you have people like Mike Huckabee and Bill Bennett who are for Common Core. You have uh, the, the left who's for Common Core. So I don't think it's a Republican Democrat thing. It's a American thing. And uh, for the record, uh, I would encourage anybody to go out and see the, the video that has gone viral over the past yes. four or five days. The, there's a, a, a father uh, essentially at a Common Core um, discussion in Baltimore and he just is asking questions and he's arrested. They haul him out. I mean, he was not being abusive at all. It was very interesting and it really seems to have ignited a lot of folks um, online. Interesting issue. We'll come back to that. Um, and speaking of technology and um, you know how things uh, get communicated these days, I, I figure we probably have about as awesome an expert on that as we possibly could have And Steve. So, so how, is, how has um, digital media and social media specifically changed the conservative equation. Well, I think it's given us a. Uh, I think it's given us a voice. I mean, I think you don't have to go through the mainstream media filter anymore. You don't have to even realize concern about um, you know television or, or, or cable or whatever. I mean, we have a story up today of people that came to us from a, the Liberty Institute on this Craig James situation, where Craig James was a broadcaster who was basically fired. Uh, because in a, in a senatorial campaign, he had uh, discussed uh, traditional marriage. Uh, and after he was already working there, somebody found the tape and they said, uh, you can't work here anymore. That, the, the, and the, today, this thing's gone viral. Uh, it's a story we worked on. It does, didn't have any uh, TV backing, any, um, any uh, broadcast backing or cable backing, and we've gotten it up and it's already, you know, it's gonna have a million page views today and, and, and go throughout. So. Um, Technological advancements, uh, where you can, you know, have a social media site, have a new site that is, you know, one fiftieth of the cost of old media has has changed the game. I mean, it's still got to be quality. You've got to know how to uh, use Twitter and Facebook uh, and other means to to drive it. Uh, and we think we've we've been pretty successful at that. And we're we're only at the top of the uh, the top of the first inning. But I think that that is what, if you think about it. Uh, bifurcating the farm bill into a food stamps bill, literally stopping the amnesty uh, bill, which was horrific. Uh, really, I think uh, bringing Obamacare up to the uh, up to the forefront, stopping Syria, stopping uh, you know more madness, helping us with the the big effort. The the big story I think is the Muslim Brotherhood being thrown out of Egypt. All of these stories in the last eight to ten weeks have all been driven by social media and by new media. Uh, everybody else has been ver Gosnell. You know, it was another one. If you look at the big stories over the, la over the summer, and that's why I keep telling people that, you know, we're winning. Uh, and one of the reasons we're winning, I don't know if it's selling outrage, uh, but it's, it's, I think, showing people that they can have a voice and you can channel that anger where before you were defenseless or before you were, you know, Craig James, even a guy his size is defenseless, is that you can take that, uh, uh, you can take that anger. And by the way, I think anger is a good thing. I think if you're fighting, this country's in a crisis, and if you're fighting to save this country, if you're fighting to take this country back, it's, you know, it's not gonna be sunshine patriots. It's going to be people who want to fight. I mean, Andrew Breitbart was all about the fight. In fact, we call ourselves internally the fight club, right? Uh, and our watchword is kind of fights that matter. Uh, and so we are very engaged, and I think you've seen from all the social media traffic and all the, the new media traffic, it, it goes to those sites that really get engaged in, in topics. And I believe we're only at the top of the the first inning, I think you're going to see all types of advancements in television and in the way to get uh, electronic content out, whether it's radio or television, that's going to change the, the, uh, the landscape of this in the next three to five years is going to be radically, radically different. And you're going to have people who you really haven't heard of today who are going to be major players both politically and through being what I call political entrepreneurs, starting institutions, starting groups. Um, Alice is, is, is a terrific example. Catherine Engelbrecht in Texas, The True of the Vote. I can give you 50 emerging 
superstars who are under the age of 30 years old who you literally probably haven't heard of today that are going to be dominant voices. And that is, they're not going to be dominant voices by going to MSNBC or CNN or the New York Times or the op-ed page of the Washington Post. It's going to be a completely different aspect to, to get there. So I think it's, I think for being a conservative and sticking to your values, I think it's a great time and I think we're winning, whether it's on guns, you name any issue, we are winning and we're winning more every day and the army that's prepared to get in back of this is getting bigger every day and more outraged. So um, we, I know other people have lots of stuff to say around this and we'll, we will get there. Uh, Norm, uh, you know, um, I, just as a point of information, I have a small company that I founded, um, it, you know, basically working with social media five years ago. And one of the reasons why I was so taken by social media was because I watched what happened uh, when your former boss took off on YouTube. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ron Paul was this completely, I mean, like, you know, a few conservatives would, or uh, libertarians would talk about him here and there. Nobody knew who he was. And then he just erupted. And I saw this amazing response amongst young people. And I, and I realized, wow, the world has just changed. What has, you know, five years later, what, what is, you know, what, what do you see? Well, I think it's totally reshaped um, the way that activism is done uh, in this country. It, it uh, used to be that uh, you would go to a county GOP meeting and talk to your congressman, call them, uh, you would wait for your direct mail pieces to tell you what was the big issues and either call or send a letter. It was very time consuming. It was very expensive. Today, um, my group, uh, Campaign for Liberty, my employer, we can do emails and get to people directly and then have the effects felt more immediately. And there's a lot of self-starting going on today. You see candidates um, fundraising. Uh, having events, you see protests and, and other forms of activism being planned on Facebook, um, totally under the radar screen, and then we, we hit them hard, we hit them fast, and because it was all done very quickly through social media, through uh, the internet, um, they don't know what's, the, the, the other side, the establishment, can be really caught flat-footed. I think that's what happened with Syria, with the Obamacare, the funding effort that's obviously a lot, big part of Senator Paul's success with the filibuster was that it got out on Twitter, on Facebook, and on the rest of the social media, whereas even 10 years ago, even five years ago, um, that would, you, people would have had to wait till it circled, cycled through the news cycles to found, find out about it. Now everybody knew about it as it was happening and was calling and sending, calling their senators um, as Rand was on the floor saying, uh, I don't see you down there standing with Rand. Get your behind down there now. Uh, so that, that's how I think it has really changed things. So, Lori, uh, like I read, uh, so, so this, this, the barbarians are at the gates. They're more than the gates. They're, they're coming over the gates. How much does that scare the establishment right in this city? I think they're incredibly frightened. Um, I'm not 100% sold on whether that's always a really, really good thing, mm -hmm. um, because I think that at times it leads people into, you know, it, it leads the Republican Party into to boxing themselves into sort of untenable solutions because they're just so afraid of being primaried. Um, so I think that there's, you know, there's positive aspects and negative aspects. Um, I think that we have seen very, very little creative policy making in Washington from conservatives. We see it some, um, but they seem to sort of want to grab onto the lower hanging fruit. I'm a little bit encouraged by, you know, the rise of the Mike Lee tax plan. I think that's a huge step forward. And it was, you know, a little bit interesting to see somebody wanting to go that far out on a limb. Presumably he is very safe, but people are, people are very, very scared. And so I think we sort of end up in the same 
repetitive conversation where they are working on very admirable goals like defunding Obamacare, but I think at times it comes to the detriment of other things that could be discussed because people aren't really willing to sort of go out on a limb and say, how should we restructure unemployment given that we're having the longest unemployment crisis ever? Or how should we structure, restructure these other programs that sort of like slash and cut, slash and cut, which has its merits, but also maybe doesn't give solutions that are going to be you know, broadly acceptable across the larger population. So I think it's a double-edged sword, but I mean, in general, in the sense that it's you know, refreshing to see people in Washington actually scared of getting kicked out for once, that's probably a good sea change, I guess. <laughs> Briefly. Obamacare. The Republican establishment, the establishment in the city, had no interest in defunding Obamacare after a certain period of time. It was the Tea Party Patriots, and it was Brent Bozell and For America, which is a Facebook page with, with four million people on it, and, and Dave Bossie and some other people and the Freedom Works guys. They had this idea in early August during the recess. Let's go have rallies. Let's start that. And all of a sudden, you know, people were mocking that effort. Right? This thing would never get to a vote in the House. Never. Five weeks ago, that was a fantasy. And people like Brent Bozell, who is part of the established, conservative establishment, who I think sees opportunity with new, new media and this new fire in this populist movement, that after a series of rallies, after a series of town halls at John Boehner's hometown, you start to see this thing pick up momentum, pick up momentum. I mean, the, the vote last week that Speaker Boehner called was historic because the establishment has said, actually, in no circumstances are we going to have that vote. And four weeks later or five weeks later, after this huge surge and then people hitting this uh, Facebook page and all that, they had a vote and voted to defund Obamacare. And Senator Cruz and, and Senator Mike Lee, the exact same thing. People mock these guys. And, and whether they can technically defund Obamacare at the end of the day, you have certainly seen a tectonic plate shift on the leadership of this movement and the leadership of this party and the leadership of what stands in the last six weeks, I believe, because of social media and because People were not taking action and were prepared to be the junior partner in the slow walk to statism that we're going to, which is to me the equivalent of the Republican slash Whig party. Okay, uh, 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 Lori, uh, briefly, and I want to get to, uh, to Brittany. Sure. Um, With all due respect. <laughs> right, and, and so to the extent that we are seeing leadership turn around on its face, that is probably at times a good thing. You know, Tim Carney had an excellent article in The Examiner, I think it was yesterday, saying that leadership painted themselves into this corner because over decades, not just recently, but over decades, they've promised conservative solutions and not delivered, whether it was Medicare Part D or other things. They said, get in line and we'll get to you. Get in line and we'll get to you. So leadership has certainly painted itself into this corner. But I do think that at times it comes... Um, with very negative consequences. You know, Eric Cantor's had all of this effort towards, you know, his Making Life Work campaign. You don't see a lot of things coming out of that. You know, I've been in meetings with Republicans where they fought and squabbled over whether they can support this conservative solution or whether it's going to get them primaried because they can't message it right. And those are, you know, honest conversations to, to have. But I think that sometimes it, it gets in the way, you know, the absolute fear of being primaried gets in the way of sort of wanting to grow out on a limb and come up with a solution that fits today's times. We will revisit that. Brittany, so, uh, you know, a lot of what you do, correct me if I'm wrong, is just outreach, you know, trying to talk to people, uh, you know, making the case for free markets and so on. How has the new media, digital media, social media changed or, you know, created what you do? Uh, so, again, mainly my job is working with Hispanics, 16 to 27, sometimes blacks, um, Indians, Asians, recent immigrants, and promoting economic freedom, limited government. And you know the new media, it's, it's a great tool. Instagram, Vine, when it was around, <laughs> um, Twitter, all that is great. Um, the problem, unfortunately, that I see is that while conservatives are using new media technologies in such a great way, it also sometimes becomes an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. So while TCOT is exploding about an issue, black Twitter is not talking about it at all. And so that's a barrier that we really have to cross. And, and forgive me for interrupting you, but just for the record, does, uh, TCOT, it's, oh. it's, so on Twitter, people use um, hashtags, okay? So, so people go on Twitter and they'll type in this word, right? And it'll bring up everything that comes under this word, all right? And TCOT is top conservatives on Twitter. So if you want to reach conservatives on Twitter, put hash TCOT or 
if you want to reach libertarians, there's tea lot and there's a yeah. million different versions. There's top prog for progressive, <laughs> just for, for, for everyone's information. So, pardon me. Uh, so I think that's, that's what I'm seeing a lot of. And I think one organization that does this really well, actually, Generation Opportunity, they use new media in a really creative way using memes. Um, I know Young Americans for Liberty does this as well. Uh, videos, memes, that kind of thing. But again, we're using new media and it's, it's helping us kind of figure out what we're doing inside the movement, but we haven't harness new media in a way to expand the movement. And that's, again, what I'm most concerned with, I guess, at this point is looking at the demographics going forward, the, the GOP is going to become a regional party if we don't learn how to expand. Um, and again, a lot of people mistake me saying this for we need to water down our principles. By no means that's what I'm saying. It's just when you look at the numbers, one in four children being born in the United States today is Hispanic. We're losing 70% of Hispanic voters at this time. If that trend continues, do the math. We no longer win. Um, so we need to learn how to use new media technologies in a way to you know, reach out to the young Hispanics, new recent immigrated, um, you know, black Twitter is a, is a thing. It's a, it's a huge thing, but you never see conservative topics kind of cross that barrier. So we need to figure out a way to um, you know, engage culture and also cross that barrier in a way that will bring people to the conservative movement. Um, by the way, just on this point, if you're if you are Twitter inclined, I really would encourage you if you use hashtags to reach out and find out what the hashtags are that other groups of people use. Use it, and then it's really cool because then it all blows up and people start <laughs> arguing with one another. It's really fun. Um, so anyway. So, uh, Alice, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, the new media really drives a lot of what you do, it, right? It, everything that I do is, is based on new media. Um, and, and it's interesting to, to tap into that. Um, politics is, is driven, our, our PR, money is spent on PR and marketing for a, a politician. If you look at the phenomenon of Ted Cruz, I was one of those people four or five years ago that was following him around with my iPhone um, when he was at a Republican women's luncheon or wherever he was. I was following him and I was one of those, uh, one of his blogger brigade. He did not announce that he was running for senator um, to the media. He had a blogger's call and he announced it to all of us because he knew one, we already had content on him. We had photos. We had videos. We could, we could turn around content quickly that was positive and pro Ted Cruz. He he took time to build that network, um, and, and it was on very little money. I, I mean, I did it because I wanted him to get elected. I believed in what he was saying, and so. What's interesting is as someone who was vehemently working against Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst because that was his opponent, I am now working very closely with Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst because he was humbled. He got his clock cleaned by Ted Cruz. He also got his clock cleaned by Wendy Davis with HB2 um, as they were passing that. And he saw firsthand how organized and how powerful the left is at a grassroots level. Ted Cruz showed how when you're organized and at a, as a grassroots level, you can be powerful and overcome the money issue. Um, so it's interesting, and in, in Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst, when you look at this, this education issue, um, I, I went and met with Governor Perry's education policy people to see where they were at, to see if they got it. They didn't. They were completely on board with the whole common core philosophy of education. I was completely disillusioned by seeing the people around Governor Perry. Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst on the other side, his people advising him, they get it and their door is open and we have access to them. And we were able, we, we had a local, um, Group, moms and dads who filed suit against their school district to keep this C scope, this curriculum, out of their schools. We were able to call the lieutenant governor and say, Can we have a press conference at the Capitol to announce that these, these parents got a, a temporary restraining order? He was open to doing that because he knows the network that's behind 
this grassroots movement um, fighting against education. But what's funny is the media showed up and, and I said, listen guys, people will say that this is political because Lieutenant Governor's running again. It is political, but not for him. The media would have never showed up if we just, a group of moms and dads who were announcing that we had a temporary restraining order, they would have never showed up. So it is political. We were using him to get the media. And I told him, I said, I could care less about your political career. I want you to fight this issue like a pissed off dad who sees children in Texas being harmed. And oh, by the way, if you fight like that, you very well might get reelected because that's what people want to see. People are hungry for the truth and they're tired of backdoor deals happening um, in, in whether it's in the Capitol in Austin or the Capitol in Washington. People just want elected officials who do the right thing because it's about the next generation, frankly. And I think that when we see politicians fight like that, you're going to bring in people um, from, from different demographics. Norm? I just wanted to uh, respond to a few of the comments. First, I think that for, if I was still advising a, an elected official um, along the philosophy of my current, of my former um, boss, Congressman Ron Paul, I would say that a winning strategy for uh, a limited government libertarian Republican should incorporate libertarian populism and re some reform ideas along the lines of Senator Lee's tax plan that does recognize that our tax and monetary policies are a burden on working and lower class Americans and that a good, solid, libertarian, limited government tax plan should be concerned about more than just the capital gains um, rate and should recognize that the payroll tax is a federal tax imposed on people that burdens American citizens just as much as the income tax does. And it just drives me crazy when Republicans say, well, poor people don't pay taxes. Um, they pay payroll and they pay sales taxes. And I think we, we as a movement and Republicans as a party really, really drop the ball when they, when they, when they say things like that. Just like when you hear some Republicans and even some conservatives pretend that the healthcare system was a free market utopia until March of 2010. <laughs> um, secondly, I think that Brittany made a really good point. Um, I think Jack <coughs> Kemp uh, used to say that people don't care if you know until they know if you care. And that means that we have to as a movement, as a party, we have to step out of our comfort zone and talk to people who aren't our base, who didn't vote for us, who maybe look at us with suspicion and maybe sometimes there's good reason for them to look at us with suspicion because that's how we, we grow. And I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, in 1996, I was campaigning for uh, Ron Paul in the congressional race uh, in a town in his, in his district called Victoria, Texas. And um, we were doing um, standard campaign stuff, sign waving and uh, literature dropping. And the gentleman I was with said, we should go and spend a couple hours in the Hispanic part of town. We were the only ones there. The, the only signs you saw in that part of town were Ron Paul signs because we went there. The Democrats took them for granted and the Republicans, every other Republican campaign had written them off. Um, I think if you look at the, at the demographics, Ron, Ron actually did better with Hispanics than most Texas Republicans, and, it was, and a lot of it was, I'm convinced, it wasn't so much that they agreed with him that we happened to find a uh, little conclave of hardcore libertarians uh, in <laughs> Texas. It was because we actually took the time to go up and say, I'm for the Ron Paul campaign. I'd like to give you some literature to explain to you what Ron is all about and why, why I would like you to consider supporting him on election day when no, no other candidate had bothered to take the time to do that. So uh, I think this speaks to an important point. I mean, it's respect, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Br uh, Brittany, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a huge part of the message that, that you know, speak to that. 
Um, so, you know, going into these communities, I actually just got back from Texas last night. I love Texas. Um, <laughs> but it's so funny, um, you know, working with students, they always have you meet at like odd hours. And I was meeting it with one of the Latino fraternities on like Friday night. And I heard this girl standing by and she said to this, this boy, like, you're a conservative? And he said, yeah. And she was like, why? They hate, <laughs> they hate us. And I was like, I'm a conservative. <laughs> And it started this conversation between probably about 10 of us, all you know, under 25 Hispanics, and we we're just sitting there. And we all started this conversation, and the biggest misconception is that we don't care, mm -hmm. and that we don't take the time to actually um, build a relationship or, or build that trust. And so you know, what I try to tell a lot of my, my conservative colleagues is that we can't win the, the votes of these, these demographics if they think that we don't care. Because all of the, you know, they see this, that the Democrats, doesn't necessarily matter what they're putting forward, but they think, oh, what they're putting forward has to help me because they care about me. Whatever the Republicans are putting forward can't help me because they don't care about me. And so that's a huge misconception that we need to get over. And um, that's what I was trying to say in, in my opening remarks is sometimes we need to remember that people digest information differently depending on their culture, or their frame of reference. And so some of the terms that we use can be just instant turnoffs. I've met a lot of Hispanics who agree with the center-right position on immigration, but because we're screaming, oh, shamnesty, or oh, Marco Scrubio, like go back to Cuba, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's over. Like we, we lost that voter. Not because they disagree with us on our principles, but because of how we were talking to them. So respect is a huge thing. We need to start that dialogue, and it needs to be respectful. And um, you know, that should be something that we focus on, is how we're marketing this message to dem different demographics. We don't all process information the same way. We don't all you know, hear. You, know, you and I might hear um, a message from, John ba or from, I don't know, from Boehner. And you might take something differently than I did. But it's, it's not because he said something different. We just have a different frame of reference. So that's something that we need to look at more closely, I think, moving forward if we want to grow the conservative movement. I think, um, I think the same is true when it comes to, to getting the women's vote, right? I mean, women on, are, are naturally more empathetic. They have this, this sense of caring, this sense of nurturing, right? And when you see, I mean, to go to, back to the social media conversation, at least initially, we're much better about it now, but initially, you know, all the social media you would see coming out of the right was like this red picture, with like red and black, and there's Obama, and it would be like, Obama hates you and is killing your children, right? And like, that's a huge turnoff for women. Or when women hear, you know, Republicans don't care about the poor, there was a great Jonathan Shait headline yesterday about the food stamp vote versus the farm subsidy vote that said, you know, Republicans, we were too nice to poor people, but don't worry, we fixed that, right? And that sort of narrative is incredibly unhelpful. And to some extent, you can't control the liberal media. And that's why social media is such a wonderful thing for letting us take back the narrative to say, like, no, let's, let's explain and have an honest conversation about food stamps and the, the rise in SNAP benefits. I think that that's something that will continue and will help us win women voters in the future, but it's just something we have to be very careful about as the Republican Party because I think we can come off as screamy and negative and we hate illegal immigrants and we hate immigrants, period, and you know, we hate poor children. And that's something that, you know, whether you're you know, a single mother all the way up to like an Ivy League educated woman, that just turns you off. Ivy League educated women can't be single. Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> well, if you look at the marriage gap. Yeah. Total joke. Um, <laughs> Actually, I, uh, no, and one last bit on this point, and then we're going to shift gears. I just want to say one a good a good thing about outrage and anger is that it does it does motivate people, and it should. When you explain to people how the government, what the government is doing, what Obamacare is, what uh, on the farm bill, how you have um, members of Congress who are receiving governments who are receiving the taxes of working people. Um, to for as part of programs that drive up your food prices, you should be outraged. You should be mad, and um, part of that is um, you, you talk about selling or, or selling outrage. I don't think we're selling outrage. I think we're trying to give people a vehicle to express their outrage, and I think that part of broadening the base of the movement is broadening the outrage to people who have. Um, been sold a bill of goods that they have no other alternative except to rely on big daddy welfare state government 
and that, that no, that is actually destroying your lives and we have a better idea for you and we are selling something called freedom and they're selling something called statism. We have a much better product and part of what we need to do is believe in it, uh, is, is actually have the courage of our convictions and some people in the Republican Party need to have convictions. Uh, the, the highest form of respect, the highest form of respect is not to happy talk people, to have an honest, to treat them with respect to tell them the truth. And there are, there are a lot of hard truths that, that have to get out there. We have to know how to articulate it. We have to say it without um, uh, denigrating people. We have to do it without uh, demonizing people. The big thing on the food stamps bill that we fought the, at Breitbart and on Fox was about the crony capitalism. This food, you do not have to demonize the poor to defeat the food stamps bill. The food stamps bill is so big because corporate America is feeding off the food stamps bill. That's the way you defeat it. But I, I am not in agreement at all that we need to be the party of empathy. And by that I mean false empathy. Because that is just the slow walk to statism. There is a certain point in time that you have to explain that these programs have not worked and they've enslaved people. And we have to be strong enough in our convictions and have the analytics to back it up, to, 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 to do that. And I think that's the highest form of respect, and I think playing the long game, that's what wins it for us over time. And um, obviously we've tapped an important vein here. <laughs> no, I mean, no. No, no, this, uh, no, 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 this is, this is, I mean, this really speaks to the heart yes. of where this movement, the Republican Party, whatever that is, um, is going. This is the question. And Steve, I, I hear what you're saying on this point. Brittany, I want you to weigh in. I'll keep it brief. Okay. I'll keep it very brief. Um, uh, I agree. I agree. I think outrage is a great motivator. I do. And I, hey, I've been out at the Planned Parenthood clinics protesting. I've been out at the Fed. I've been out at the White House protesting because I was so angry. The thing is, I went all of my other Hispanic friends to be there with me. And if we are um, so outraged to the point where some of the things that we say are careless or reckless, they're never going to be outraged with us. And that's my point. I do think outrage is a great motivator. I completely and 100% agree with you. My problem is when we're so blinded by our outrage that we unnecessarily and inadvertently push other people away. And I think we need to realize that that's a fine line as a movement and start recognizing when we're crossing it. Excellent point. Alice. Well, it's interesting because as women, we are nurturers and we, we are empathetic. But the other side of that is when women and moms know the truth and when we give, give information and those analytics. I was talking about this earlier. Dr. Peg Lessig talks about why are there all these women out fighting against education and what's going on in the education system. And she said, a man will stand in the line of fire for his child. He will die for his child. A mother will kill. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so armed with truth, there is nothing that will stop. Me as a mother, I get up every single day and fight the good fight because of my children. They are the next generation. And I will not die without trying to get them truth. And, and they know it. They're embarrassed by me a lot. Um, but now they, they've kind of come for full circle where, where my daughter, um, who has, you know, she doesn't have the mom at home who's, you know, doing crafts with her. She's got this crazy political activist mom who's not home. And she said, Mom, I just want you to know I appreciate what you're doing because I know it's for the future. So there's something powerful in channeling that anger and, and truth at the same time. I think Bill wanted to Well, uh <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, it's not true. We're going to have Q&A here shortly, Bill, but go ahead. We're dying over here, too. We're, we're getting there. we got five minutes to go. Excuse me. 
On the left, the outrage model you, uh, works very effectively, and many on the left use it very cavalierly and, and arrogantly, uh, knowing that demonizing the other side isn't reflecting the truth, but that it does motivate the base, and it builds their power. It's a masculine, if you will, uh, 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 system that drives people to action. Now, and that's all good. I'm not going to stop them from being from using the outrage model. We try to use the outrage model as a first step to get people into dialogue. But I think that it is extremely dangerous for the conservative movement to adopt the outrage model from this point on. It's like the leftists who say, well, we got this far battering the companies. We got them to the table by battering them, so let's batter them even more. They accomplish nothing in 20 years, but they feel good about their motives, and they feel like they're building a movement. They feel the world is with them, and any day now, it's gonna be a majority. I think that, that they, let me just finish. Let me, let me just finish. I think that this is a losing model. I think this is a I will die for my country model. I will die for my party model. I don't think that it wins on the issues that you're, that you're, that you're laying out. I think that it, it, that it brings the opposite. It's fine to harness outrage, absolutely. But if you harness outrage in a way that is interpreted by women voters in a strong majority, to push them aside, and Hispanics to push them aside, then you are building yourself a sinking ship. And I think that while outrage is legitimate, think about it very, very strategically, understand it's a strategy, not a truth, use it intelligently, and have a positive agenda that speaks to the underlying objectives that women and Hispanics and others bring to the table. Otherwise, you're forcing yourself into a Rockefeller Republican future where you bring very strong ideals in and then have to compromise halfway between yours and a, and a big government agenda. That's not what you want. If you want conservatism, you need to build an organic conservatism with a positive message. Okay. Sorry for cutting in. All right, all right. so, and I'm gonna go to you, Steve. Um, okay. I think an interesting distinction there, though, is that, um, you know, as opposed to, uh, to anyway, Steve, you, you speak to this. But this is, here, here's the thing. I think this is a massive apparatus, right? It, it spends $4 trillion a year just on current outlays. But the size of it is much bigger than that, right? If you look at all the liquidity that's put into the system after the financial crisis, you have to give a shock to that system. The shock that you give is to channel, in a positive sense, not negative sense, the outrage, and I think that's the whole basis of the Tea Party movement. That's the whole basis of this new media movement. It is empowering people to say, I can actually have an impact. We had one of the biggest, in 2010, we had one of the biggest uh, congressional victories ever. Now, not a lot came out of that. You're starting to see those elements of, of, of change and of limited government. And you've even seen it in the Orwellian words like reform. The establishment, shocked to death of this libertarian populist movement that's starting to catch fire, test markets words that work. The Frank Luntz model. Here's a word that works. It's reform. Let's be the reform guys. Right? When they're not really interested in any type of reform, what they're interested in is a, a be the junior partner in increasing statism. Okay? So outrage is not said in a negative sense, but you need that, I think, to give the system a shock. Right? to then really get on the table a negotiating position. Everything we've done about limiting, everything we've done about limiting spending, everything we've done about limiting government, everything that's been, all the positive accomplishments have come from the building of that outrage and people realizing they will pay a penalty uh, at, the, uh, at the ballot box to do it. And that's why I think crony capitalism and, and all these issues that are now kind of on the distant horizon are gonna be bigger and bigger and bigger. And that all comes from kind of this this outrage. So it's not said in a negative or pejorative sense that to demonize people. One of the things we've gone out of our way to do is not to demonize. And I think the perfect example is food stamps. You know, we had a special on Hannity. We had two specials on Hannity. One was specifically about food stamps. And the whole point was the crony capitalism and back of the explosion in the food stamps business. This is not about demonizing the poor. And so we think there's a lot of positive things. But I think the energy, the fire, the passion to get people to show up, and there's a lot more hours. We're, we're only at the top of the first inning, right, in, in taking our country back. So you're going to need a lot of passion and a lot of the Ron Paul type of fire, the Rand Paul type fire, the Ted Cruz type fire. We are um, selling something positive. We're selling liberty. And if you look at the Ron Paul 2012 campaigns and the rallies, 
Th those were people who were excited. They were outraged what's going on, but they also were very positive, very hopeful. And there is a positive message that, that Ron um, always made the focus and that those of us who work with him still always try to keep the focus, which is that liberty brings people together. It is we, it's a unifying ideal, not a, not, a dividing, not a divisive ideal, and that the idea that you're better off it's for your own good that you want freedom, not just, for an, not just for an abstraction, and that freedom is for everybody. And, I, and, and, I, and to the extent, if we, if we don't do a good enough job of selling the positive yeah. message, that, that doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means that we need to continue to improve how we um, market and, ref, and refrain and present our ideas. Right. So, Lori, uh, I, uh, forgive me, I keep you know, you, you know, we, 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 I keep using you as like a touchstone. You know, um, there's so many things bouncing around in yeah, here right now. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So, so, so I'm going to ask you a one question that, that uh, so um, it seems that there is huge energy coming from the outside, forcing change within the conservative movement. Um, but to what degree, and this is a total softball, to what degree do these folks need to make friends? or at least acknowledge the power structure with, you know, within the establishment? It's actually not a softball question. I think that's, I think that's a really tricky thing. That's, that's a really tricky relationship to, to work. Um, I mean, because it goes back to what I said earlier, that when people have you know, the fear of God of being primaried, they're scared to do anything. Um, and so to the extent that we, we see this outrage or we want to build, you know, we want to, I will say on the outrage thing, I think that you can't start with outrage. I think that at least you can, for people who are already engaged, you can totally start with outrage. People that are like, screw the government, it is their fault, I am a libertarian, right, or whatever. Like you, there is a crowd of people where outrage is a perfectly reasonable starting point for people who aren't as politically inclined, who are sitting on the fence thinking about these issues, going back and forth, like reading Time Magazine or whatever, right? Like, you can't necessarily, you have to have a conversation where you explain what you're about, why you think, you know, this person may be experiencing their problems and frustrations with the state of America today, win them to your side, and then channel them into outrage. That said, you know, we can optimize messages with millions of messages perfectly tailored for little people because that's like the wonder of the um, data world that we live in. So I don't think that it has to be one or the other where we have to live in a world of outrage or a world of not. Um, but back to once we have people outraged, how do they need to work within Washington? I do think that there needs to be at least a little, a little bit more of an understanding because you can see it after what happened in 2010. I mean, we only won the House. We didn't win the House and the Senate, and we had no chance of winning the White House, and relatively little has come out of the 2010 Congress. Um, we may win the House and the Senate in 2014, and that would be great, but then we still have a White House to deal with. It is very, very easy for leadership to shut you out. It is very easy for the White House to shut you out. If you're not at least willing to come to the table to some extent, I mean, farm subsidies would have been a great example. It's somewhere that the House could have actually conceded did something that Obama and the Senate Democrats wanted, and that would have been against crony capitalism, yet they were incapable of doing that. So I think that there's your organization, by the way, did some very good work proposal. on that, by the and way. And so did you. Um, and so I think it's incredibly important to think about not just how can we apply political pressure for goals that will never be met, like defunding Obamacare, which is a very important goal, but let's face it, is not going to go somewhere during the fall of 2013, to say what are some other places where we can work together within the existing power structure to achieve mutually agreeable goals that you don't have to compromise on. So. So, um, Alice, like you're, you know, all of us at least kick around the beltway on a regular basis. You like live in America and, <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and uh, so what is your sense? I mean, where, where is the body politic right now? Like, what is the feeling in, Not in the heart of the, the country? Beltway. Not with the beltway. And, and it's interesting because when you look if you look at the, the marketing from the left, how many of you saw the video, Mr. Kid President? Have any of y'all seen Mr. You've seen Mr. Kid President. He's this precious little black kid all that <laughs> all over Facebook, all over YouTube. I think it's up to 28 million hits. 
And it's this kid, he's Mr. Kid President. And he, you know, is playing the role, but it's not political at all. He doesn't talk, all he talks about is go be great, just be awesome, you know, and, and that's all we need to do. And, and who tapped into the greatness of this kid? Was it Romney or was it Obama? Well, it was Obama. He invited him to the White House. He, they did another YouTube video, and he's walking around showing him Lincoln, showing him Mar Martin Luther King, and this kid is Mr. Kid President. He's now the spokesman to children in America. Um, he, he's the kid that invites them all to the White House for the Easter egg hunt. How many conservative Republicans have even seen that video or even know about that video? And I love that video. I, I push it out because it makes me feel good. I want to be great. And he tells, you, you old people, y'all are boring. <laughs> so that narrative online that our kids are seeing, that the next generation are seeing, they just want to feel good. They're scared to death. They feel what's going on, and they want to go to a safe place. And, and it's interesting because when you talk about the issue of education, one of the things, you know, you would think that as a conservative Republican, I would be all for school choice. I mean, that's the narrative that yes, the left you. has. That's the narrative that the left has. Those, those right-wing Republicans, they're for school choice. They're against public schools. They're against, you know, and they've created that divide. Well, when I go in and talk to groups about education, let's define school choice. Because for me as a mom, school choice means I look in my little community to see what is available for my children and what's the best thing. It might be public school, it might be private school, but here's the deal. When you look at this federal takeover of our education system right now, and as we're pushing for school choice, if we collapse, if we allow them to collapse our public school system, we have just gone to a, a charter school, a vouchers, a private school, where they are all run by appointed boards. Those appointed boards are beholden to who's giving the grant money. We have just taken away our fundamental right, the beauty of the local public school system, for elected officials. A elected school board. If I don't like what's going on in Argyle, Texas, I go up to my school board meeting and I raise holy heck. They know who I am. And that's the power of a mom and dad. So we have to, and so when I go in and I'm talking to education people, they think I'm going to come in and just, you know, talk about how horrible they are, that they're a bunch of socialists and communists. And I say, no, let's work together because do you see what's, do we really see what's happening? And let's talk about the issues and come together at the local level. Everything can't be fixed in the Beltway. Everything can't be fixed in, in our state capitals. It has to be taken down to the local level. And there, there's a video of, of Bill Ayers and he's talking to a group um, of community organizers. And he said, listen, don't try to seek the, the seats of power that you don't have access to, the president, senators, congressmen. Go to the seats of power that you have direct access to, city council, mayors, and school boards. So until conservatives understand that we've got to get down to the ground level and take our country back, one school board, one mayor, one city council at a time, and not depend on the beltway to fix it for us, it's going to be us, not elected, elected officials. All right, so now we're, we're going to go to the audience, because um, I have a feeling people want to weigh in. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit of that, and then we'll come back and, and finish up. Uh, who wants to go first? Could you identify yourself? Yeah, I'm Catherine Sirks, um, for profit side of Square One Media Network and nonprofits, Doctor Patient Medical Association. Um, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm really disagreeing with some of what I hear. When you talk about analytics, 
The analytics get us nowhere. We keep using truth and analytics to argue our points, and it falls on deaf ears. And what I hate to say is that, especially coming from what we talked about this morning as well, we heard that younger people like our ideas but think we're old-fashioned. They like our principles, but not our policies. Um, so we lose them somewhere in the delivery. They can't make that leap. Um, I think it's, a, I hate to say it, but I think we've got a style versus substance problem. We've got the substance, and we just keep hammering on substance. And I'm sorry to say, but the truth doesn't seem to matter because it can be distorted in any way that is wanted. As Bill pointed out, the left using the anger to completely distort the truth and create the outrage on their side. And we, um, except in some areas where our principles don't match our policies in the, in the social area, but we won't get off onto that, we need to shake it up how we deliver and how we look. And I'll give you a quick example. Was I was doing a Senate campaign two year, three years ago. Um, through a series of events, I had a, a, an online news agency next to my office in Seattle. And <clears throat> they came over to tell me about a candidate, uh, uh, a candidate saying something. And my answer to him was, well, so Dino says basically F, let's see, I almost said it, F the, the people, the yeah, public. We're not working blue here. So. Okay. <laughs> Fuck. Um, oh, okay. and, and so, and then, and then he wrote me back and said, well, I won't, I'm not going to use that. And I said, you know what, go ahead and use that because I was on the phone call where this candidate spoke and he used that word. So they used it. This turned into a huge blowout that how all of a sudden this, this Republican, how this is how Republican Christians really talk when they're alone. So I get back on all the left wing blogs and say, what makes you think I'm a Republican or a Christian? Because I'm Jewish and conservative. And so that shut them up. Um, and the conservatives jumped on me, but all the left wing blogs were saying, you know, I really have new respect for Clint Didier and Catherine Sirks because they actually said something straight out. And it was a game changer in terms of the perception. Um, and I don't recommend everybody go out and drop F-bombs, but, not a good idea. you know, I show up at their cocktail parties. Um, I actually don't drink or anything, but I'm pretty obnoxious, um, even without drinking. Norm can attest to that. <laughs> I, I got that part. Yeah. I'm, you know, I can, and, and I'm mouthy, and I, and, I, and I swear like a sailor, and I usually don't, ch you know, change that. Um, and it's, I don't have a whole lot of trouble going out and speaking to, like, I went, to, um, Al Sharpton had me up to speak at National Action Network, um, and, I, and I criticized Hillary Clinton to them. As they were talking about the man, I talked about the woman. And, and so I, I'm coming back to the style versus substance, and it pains me to say that, but we need to, I mean, how, we've got to change. It's like the fact that you even feel the need to explain a hashtag. Mm -hmm. Because I know that I have to. Is a bad sign. It <laughs> probably is. Who's next? Let's 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 go up front here first. We need the next. What I'm getting at is we need our narrative. We need our stories, especially because I work in healthcare. The stories of people being harmed, right. rather than their stories of the uninsured. Gotcha. So I, can I, can I say something? Sorry. Sure. Okay, so I, I do, I acknowledge that um, what, what you're citing is, is definitely true. I think that we are, though, making massive inroads. You know, I worked at the American Enterprise Institute for a while. Arthur Brooks' latest book, The Road to Freedom, was all about how we need to change our messaging. You see people talking about messaging in the pages of commentary. And while all of us, you know, sort of DC wonks talk and ponder over messaging strategies, we actually have groups like Libra Initiative or Generation Opportunity or Campaign for Liberty who are out there trying to make those changes. I mean, there are so many younger people that I think sort of their establishment population are a bit unaware of that really do employ interesting messaging strategies. We have a long way to go. I mean, I am keenly aware that we have a long way to go and we're very far behind. But I think it's something that we could be positive about. Super, super briefly, I think um, you guys both hit the nail on the head. I think something that we, because we're conservatives, we're very you know much individual, like the smallest minority is the individual. Um, sometimes we forget it like, Sometimes it's just nice to see someone that looks like you delivering the message. The messenger does matter. It's true. And so when, when I'm going to be honest, like I went to a frat party to talk about economic freedom. And it was really well received. I got tons of signups and people were asking if they could volunteer, but I didn't go like this. 
<laughs> you know, right. um, we always you go to you know you go to CPAC and you see like sixteen year olds wearing bow ties and blue blazers and. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> there's not. There's not, not. Not anything wrong with that necessarily, but sometimes it would be nice to see a little bit of variety. Like, um, why aren't we bringing Big Boy to CPAC? He's an outspoken libertarian black rapper. I would be absolutely for that. Uh, <laughs> if, if you can make that happen, and I will Vince, make it happen. And Vince Vaughn, too. Yeah, Vince uh, oh, Vaughn, Big Vince Boy, awesome. Daddy Yankee. Why aren't we bringing these people to come, you know, be figureheads for us? Um, so I guess that's, I completely agree with everything that you guys just said. Norm. Well, I think that that might be true, except I would point out that the most popular candidate, Republican candidate of the 2012 cycle was a 76-year-old um, white, white Christian Texan whose biggest vice <laughs> is chocolate chip cookies. Um, the reason that he was pop was because he, his message was what his message was. And he didn't, I can tell you, uh, having worked as his aide for many years, that he doesn't change his message for an audience. But, 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 and that's something but, 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 that people but, 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 did do, do respond to is authenticity. I think you, that we, we, can't, we can't get so slick and so concerned about messaging that we forget to give our message and not try to be too clever by half. And sometimes, too, I think that, that, that Republicans' attempts to connect with the, with, with the younger demographic, it, it can be inauthentic and it can be a little bit embarrassing, like that uncle who right. tries to be cool by telling you that, I just heard that new Mumford and Nephew song on the radio yesterday. By, 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 by the way, by the way, it's Ron Paul. So from what I could gather from it, I basically totally disagree with everything you said, but um, <laughs> in, in, the, in, the point, in the point that you fall into a very, a trap that I think a lot of people are falling into, that this is a Harvard Business School Procter & Gamble exercise on marketing, okay? If we get Frank Luntz with words that work, we put a happy smiley face on it and better messengers, right, and tell stories that that's going to somehow uh, shift the country to, to, to our side. I think the country's there. And I think Ron Paul's campaign, I'm not a libertarian, okay? I'm a conservative, I'm not a libertarian. His, his, by the way, his, his, his campaign had more young people than anybody. It, if you went out of the campaign trail, it galvanized people. And by the way, what does Ron Paul do? He talks about analytics. This younger generation is very smart and they know how to, and they can smell inauthenticity immediately, right? I don't think I pronounced it correctly, but they can smell it. They want what's real. And one of the things they want is real is they want the truth because they can kind of dig around and get it, right? And that's what Ron Paul's message, I think, galvanized people. And I'm not a libertarian because I could see it in a very raw, unvarnished, anti-marketing campaign. Got these people. And so I think our future lies with now taking that to the working class people, to minorities, uh, and, and, and really out into the community to show them what our values are and how we stand by those values. And we do not come here, right, to, to Washington and try to do something else, that we stand by that. And I think Ron Paul's ability to stand by that is what galvanized, and I think you're starting to see people who are not libertarians, like Ted Cruz, and people like Mike Lee, that they're, they're, they see that, right? And that is what's kind of Sarah Palin to a degree. Michelle Bachman, you're seeing that those people, you know, galvanize followers. And I think it's, I, I do not believe that we just think we have a marketing plan problem, right? That we can just fall in there. Uh, I would like to address my, uh question or comment uh, to the issue of, of, of how you might combine, like on a Pacific issue, so the sort of intellectual thrust of the critique of conservatives and libertarians towards the um, statist regime and its continued development and connecting with the Hispanic population. One of the things that I don't think is widely known is that the farm program uh, has made corn so cheap in Mexico that it has made it impossible for the small campesino there to sell his corn uh, to, for the to uh, tortillas that they're made there. They're now driven out of business and that is producing part of the massive migration from, to the north to the, and then to the United States. On top of that, a lot of the, of the um, people who are here come without their families. And if you know something about that community, you'll find that there are men who live in, in sort of broken down basements and things and send their money back to their families and do not see their wives or children 
for years and years and years. So it seems to me that if you wanted to connect a, an attack on the bloated government that has this massive amount of money that goes to subsidize enormous corporations that sell through the PL480 programs and others, uh, US products uh, to, to these countries that derive masses of people out of work and wanted to connect with young uh, migrants in this country, you would show that you had compassion for the people by combining your understanding of their circumstances and the nature of a huge statist subsidized industries that have deprived them of their livelihoods in not only in Mexico, but in uh, Central America and the PL4080 program goes all the way down to you know, Peru or uh, other areas. So if you wanted to reach and show in an intellectual way and also a compassionate way, it seems to me this is just one program you could target that would help you speak to the um, Mexican and other Central American populations that are here. And then, then you would sort of meet in one blow your issue of showing that I care, along with pointing out where the United States itself is at fault in producing the problem. It now wants to build borders with additional billions of dollars to keep the people from coming to the United States that you're depriving them of their livelihood abroad. So I do think that there is a possibility to combine the signal that you care with an, an illustration of the nature of the state that pretends to care, but is actually depriving them of their, uh, their wives, their children, and their families. Because most of these people do not want to leave their little villages and their homes. They would like to have a livelihood. And so I would just say that we could do this with issue after issue that would sh show that we Perfect. do care about these people, and it is linked to the problem of the gross bureaucratic statism that is suffocating this country and many of our friends. That, that, that's, that, that was pretty well that's said. That's very well said. It was fantastic. Fantastic. Um, yeah, please do. Um, I think, obviously, you hit the nail on the head, and you literally laid out almost step by step a lot of what Libre, where I work, is, is doing. I would encourage you all to, to check out our, our website and some of our, our YouTube videos. We issue Libre statements. The Libreinitiative.com. Okay. It's long, I know. Um, but the problem that we're running into is that not enough of us are doing exactly what you just said. The problem is that we so just there. Part, part of this could be an educational program where you would link this and teach this to the young people and have them provide the message. What we're actually doing, um, and I don't want this to become a Libre infomercial, but so I actually run okay. the, the youth department <laughs> for Libre. We actually have PowerPoint presentations, we have videos, we go in and we talk to Latino based student groups, we talk to Latino uh, young professional groups, we talk to Latino working groups in the communities around the country, and we sit down and we actually break down, you know, we use so many buzzwords in this area, like sound money supply, who knows what that is? But you touched on that topic in that story you just gave about sending money back to you know, his family. So we break down these topics, property rights, limited government, sound money supply, and we put it into a, a relative term that they understand how it affects their life on a daily basis, and then how economic freedom, how liberty-minded individuals and liberty ideas would remedy those problems. So we are working to do that. I mean, we're only two years old, but that's exactly what we're doing when we're going into these communities. I was just at uh, Texas A&M we met with a Hispanic Networking Summit, met with a bunch of the Latino fraternities there, and we're getting them involved. We get th we're getting them to volunteer with Libre to then help host events in Bryan, Texas, in College Station, Texas, and the local areas. And we're trying to redo that in all of the areas and states that we're currently in. So, but you hit the nail on the head. I think that was great. Fantastic. All right. No, no, yeah. yeah, David Jenkins with uh, Conserve America Education Fund. We've been talking about truth and having the facts on your side, and we've also talked about the new media. And I was curious about people's view of how the new media tends to let people kind of gravitate toward an informational source that reinforces their own personal views, irrespective of the facts. And, you know, while we can all look at NBC, I mean MSNBC, and, or maybe NBC, and, you know, scream at the TV about, you know, them having their facts wrong, 
you know, legitimately, you can do a lot of the same things on the right. One thing that's driven me absolutely crazy over the last couple of years is there was a light bulb efficiency standard that was passed in 2007. You go to talk radio, Fox News, wherever, you hear constantly that we're all going to be reduced to the squiggly little compact fluorescence. It was stated as fact. People were, were asked to stock up on the other bulbs. It was never true. You just go to Home Depot, you'll find out the lighting manufacturers had already built incandescent that met the standard. But yeah, it was constantly repeated. It was an echo chamber. And we talked about, you talked about the echo chamber. So we've got this new media, but how do we prevent on the right from our messages of truth getting obscured by the fact that so often we fall victim to some of the same things that we see on the left where we're actually stating things or people claiming to be conservative are stating things that are totally factually inaccurate. Because, you know, conservatism is a big part, it's about being prudent. And to be prudent, you have to base your policies and your decisions on hard facts. Not what people want to be facts, <clears throat> not what people decided they believe in conspiracy theories, but real facts. So how do you see that new media, you know, being a, uh, on the right, being able to control the new media to the point where we actually are not getting hurt by the fact that, that misinformation is out there, you know, being given on our behalf. I want to speak briefly on that point. Uh, this, this is a common refrain that we hear, um, especially people who operate in new media a lot. It's like, you know, is it legit and there's false information out there and so on. Um, I, I will hand this off to the panel, but I will say that a lot of new media, it, 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 there's a, the, one becomes sophisticated in, in new media fairly quickly and the nonsense in social media that everybody's afraid of, that the establishment media always is, oh look, it's all fake. People know what's fake. I mean, people who spend time online are like, that's a fake story, and they move on. You know, and so that, that sophistication has really increased over the past three years, and that's something that there definitely seems to be a disconnect. And I'll, I'll, I'm gonna go to Steve on this because. I, I want to, I was trying to say something. I, I'm a big believer in markets, right, in the efficiency of markets. Um, you know, I think that we have a, a, a fairly efficient market for information. I'm not familiar with the, the light bulb uh, part of it, it's something I haven't focused on, but. I don't see a lot of, of stories come up that don't have a strong factual basis or can't show the analytics in back of it that stand to, to stand uh, stand up very long. I mean, I think one of the reasons that the immigration bill is is you know they're going to have to try some and run, but they can't get a vote on it is a simple basis that they literally had no facts on their side. And so people like Jeff Sessions' staff, Mike Lee's staff, Rand Paul's staff, Ted Cruz's staff, who are a lot of those guys are former prosecutors. Their staffs are very analytical and they go at things in a very kind of professional way. When the information started coming out, hard information, the, the, the amnesty bill just kind of you know, imploded and it's because of information. So I'm not familiar with the specific uh, case you state, but I, I don't see a lot on the right where you have a ton of these, particularly big narratives that are based upon, because you have so much of the professional left whether it's Media Matters or, 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 or you know, all ProPublica, a lot of the Soros operations that do nothing all day long but troll uh, you know, conservative sites to, to bring out the smallest factual you know, imbalance at all. So I, it's always a fear, but I think that there's a fa fairly efficient market out there uh, for information. Maybe, that's, uh, maybe I, that's my own bias. What do you, I agree with you for the record. Yeah. <laughs> I go around the state and the country training grassroots people how to use um, social media to drive a narrative. And one of the things that I talk about is I'm one of those people, I, I'm a connected authority on social media. I post news and information all day long on, on Facebook and Twitter. But I control, I get my news and information from source, sources that I have over time become, uh, I know that are trustworthy. So, but then you've got the engaged minority. Those are the people, the grassroots uh, people that show up at tea party meetings. They're usually 65 and older, <laughs> and they, they are there because they know the truth, they know what's going on, but they don't know what to do except go to meetings and talk to other people in an echo chamber that agree with them. And then you have this passive majority of people that's still watching Dancing with the Stars, 
and has no clue of what's going on. And so part of what we're doing with Voices in Power is training those engaged minority folks to be the connected authority. The more people that we have out there using Facebook and that are, are posting news and information, that's how we will disseminate our message. I tell people, I can write a blog post, but your friends and neighbors don't know and love me. They know and love you. And so I think in building an army, if you will, or a network of people who are taking out our message, we have to we have to go out there and talk to people and you know it's interesting i would love we have these communication teams all across the state of texas who have taken on different issues um, our, our three main issues are education um, national security and immigration we have a conference call every wednesday night where we have you know anywhere from fifty to hundred people on our call and to be able to tap into a resource like yours and have you on our call, that's the kind of networks that are being built now. And, and it's, it's interesting because those people, those 65 and older who show up at Tea Party meetings five years ago would have never been on Facebook and Twitter. And now they're on Facebook and Twitter, and they're having an impact on their children and their grandchildren. When they see their grandchild posting something on Facebook, they'll they'll get into a debate <laughs> with them. We had a uh, we have a program called Generation Mentor, and and we go in, and I had these young college kids um, go in and teach an uh, older group um, how to just post on Facebook, and this young girl got up to the group and she said listen thank you so much for being here she said when i post information conservative information i get slammed by the left and she goes now that i know that you're friends with me on facebook i know you've got my back and so i think creating those relationships between generations and then with our messaging is is how we'll reach that passive majority next question I've got the so mic. He's got the mic. Oh, oh well, okay. Well, since Stephen has the mic, he gets to go next, and then you can go. Okay. Um, you know what's interesting, like listening to this panel and also reflecting back on the discussion this morning, is that, you know, we're dealing not with one problem, but with sets of problems. And this is one of the things that technology actually helps us with is crowdsourcing, distributed networks, and things like that, in terms of being able to say, okay, you guys have covered that piece, you all cover this piece, you guys cover this piece. And, and my thought is that we're kind of like the blind people around the elephant. I think that when you talk about outrage and you talk about, and you talk about taxes and you talk about, um, and how Charlie was talking this morning about guns, that these are things that have a cultural echo that date back to 1776. Like the, that you know, it's why we fought the original American Revolution. It's all there in the Declaration of Independence and stuff like that. So when you talk about the outrage, it's like you're tapping into deep, deep, deep cultural stuff that I don't know comes to the surface in American life a lot, but that it feels like you all are, are hitting it and coming to it. But when you start talking about kind of the new frame you know, the way, that, the way that people are today, the concerns that they have, and you'd start talking about, you know, what is happening in my district in this, that's equally valid, that's valid. They're not in opposition to each other, they're kind of more like complementary to each other. And my question though is, do, do we have such a, um, a thing of like having to sh sharpen up, this is my thing, not your thing, that it's, that it's blurring the lines about seeing people as being on the same team? Or is there still a thing of like, yeah, I'm, I really need to sharpen up my, my part of the elephant, but I still get the idea that I can, I can count on you guys to be dealing with that other part. How do you, how do you all feel about that? The same team as when Ted Cruz goes on Fox News on Sunday, that opera, uh, oppo research is leaked to him by leadership of the Republican Party to demonize him. So is that, that, is so, that, is so that, you is are that, feeling like the, the cleavages I, I, are going way I, I, deeper. What I'm saying is that it is, it is very evident that to a large extent people, certain people aren't on the same team. And I think that, I think that the Tea Party 
in the libertarian movement, in the populist movement, all this kind of grassroots, the outsider party, right, has, has comported themselves with an incredible respect and dignity and, and to fight an embedded aristocracy that is, is it's Stalingrad. And they will, look at, look at on Sunday. Sunday is gonna be a, a very, and by the way, this Sunday issue is not going to die. That is gonna be a very big issue. Sarah Palin's gonna to continue to make it a big issue. Other people are gonna reach out to Mitch McConnell and make it a big issue. At Breitbart, we're gonna make it a big issue. It is unacceptable to have the, the establishment try to destroy somebody on a cable TV show at a very important time. And so that to me is we gotta face a hard truth. Not everybody's on the same team here. And some people would rather have people just pat them on the head or destroy them and have them go away and they're not going away. It, it's unacceptable also considering that, that this is the same leadership team that's been whining for a month about how Ted Cruz is attacking um, other Republicans and he's, be, he's, be, he's the one being destructive. We're the ones who who are a problem. You hear this, the liberty movement is the problem. We went down to Tampa last month, last year. I was part of the Ron Paul 2012 um, convention team and we were going to, we told, Dr. Paul told all his delegates, be firm but be respectful. Do not embarrass um, Mitt, Mitt Romney. Uh, we're, we're there to make our presence felt but to let them know that they don't have to fear us. And what happened? A gentleman named Ben, ben Ginsburg engineered a kick of the teeth and a rules committee and a rules change that stripped power away from the grassroots, made that part of the establishment. Now, how am I supposed to go to liberty activists right. and say, the Republican Party is welcoming you with open arms? How, 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 how are we in good conscience um, supposed to tell our people to um, hold your nose and vote for Mitt Romney when he's kicking us in the teeth. You, you no, we're not on the same team. 1776. In 1776, probably 5 to 10 percent of the people in this country fought for liberty. Okay, one third was the Tories, one third are in the middle, and even of the third that were on our side, a lot of them were saying, I don't know if I want to get in the fight. This is a fight. This is a fight for our country. It's not going to be done by cocktail parties and, 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 and you know, um, dinners. Panels. It's, it, panels. I hate to say it's not going to be done by panels. It's going to be done what Ron Paul's guys did in the street, what Ted Cruz is doing, what Sarah Palin's doing, right? What, what these new media sites are doing, what, what Brent Bozell is doing with For America. That is what's going to win this fight. And guess what? It's going to be quite ugly, I believe. And you right. can see the ugliness on Sunday. So, that, that all right. Said, so, we, do so want to build a big, we do want to build a big team and, I, I, um, and a diverse team. Of as soon as the establishment surrenders, we're ready to do a big team. Ready to have a big All team. right, guys. Right. <laughs> Lori, again, the touchstone. Um, so I'm going to disagree. <laughs> um, surprise. Um, so here, here's the thing, and I hope that this comes off coherent as I, I see it in my head. Um, so I think there are two fronts. I think that policy is a spectrum. I think that the AFPs of the world, the Freedom Works, all of those people are incredibly necessary because they paint an ideal of where we should be, where we would like to go. It's an active base that cares passionately about what they think we should be as a nation. Then there's everyone else. And this is where like the American Enterprise Institutes and groups like that sort of work, which isn't in this like 100 or nothing, you know, like maybe we should take that 10 for one tax deal, right? Like, because it's unrealistic to think that tomorrow there's going to be a broad enough base supporting AFP, Heritage Action, Freedom Works, as much as I hope they grow. I love these organizations and I hope that they grow and that they expand and support. But you have to work on solutions that are feasible for the, um, for the immediate term, and Norm is sighing at me right now because I know that he does not like that statement. But I just don't think so. I mean, be, just because inside of the activists, inside of conservative activists, I was at Right Online three weeks ago and had a Florida activist try to explain to me that I needed to help her because FEMA was going to raise her national flood insurance program rates. It's like keep the government hands <laughs> off of my Medicare, right? So there's an extent to which rallying the base is incredibly helpful. Then there's also like sort of an extent to which pol policy is actually made in Washington. And I think we should push that envelope as far as you can in the the direction of liberty but I think that at some point I wish so to your original question 
I do think that there is an increasing divide inside the conservative movement. I think the RSC is, continue, is increasingly separated from the rest of the Republican Party. And I think RSC is having trouble within its own ranks because they just kicked Heritage out of the RSC members meeting. Yeah, this is, these are really bad signs if what you want is people to come back together. But in the policy community more broadly, I actually think that we are reaching more towards synthesis once you move away from the Hill. I think that, you know, back to my original statement, I think that Ross Douthat and Ben Dominich actually get closer together every time they write an op-ed about where the conservative movement should go. I think that they are sort of winnowing in on a sweet spot that I'm really, really in favor of. I would like to think that we can get that to people on the Hill. I'm less sure about that because the divide does just seem to be all right. Increasing. I do Hello. not think that that's helpful. Oh, you're welcome on my team. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And for I sure. Love for sure. No, and on, I love and on, and and on, and on the really far and on the farm bill, you you and I were together, and there's an example where the policy community, the activist mm -hmm. community on agriculture subsidies, got got rolled by by the establishment, and they they didn't want to hear the reform ideas. They wanted to pass a big spending agriculture bill, and then distort the position of the coalition by saying, well, it was just a farm bill, and you said you didn't want a farm slash food stamp bill, so we gave you um, what you wanted. Why are you mad at us? Right. So uh, I actually spoke uh, with, we spoke on the phone last week about Tampa, um, Alice and I. Uh, and it was very interesting. Alice, uh, um, you know, you're, you're kind of classic Texas Tea Party. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and would it be fair to say that that experience um, um, colored or shifted or maybe radicalized is the wrong word, your perspective on some things? Definitely. And I think a coalition was built actually between conservatives and libertarians mm -hmm. um, in Tampa. Um, I was telling Nick, I was sitting at Hope and Change with sitting next to Pat Cadell um, when the floor vote was happening. and. Um, my, my phone was going nuts, and, and I looked at Pat, and I said, I am totally sick to my stomach. I said, right now, I'm watching this documentary, uh, A Hope and Change, of how these Democrats were completely snowed. Mm -hmm. And right at this very moment, Republicans all across this country are being completely snowed because they have no idea that their state's rights are being taken away. And to me, um, as a conservative Republican Texas mom, um, it opened my eyes to reality. And that this battle, you know, Pat Cadell says it brilliantly, it's not a Republican thing or a Democrat thing, it's an American thing. And when we start fighting for freedom as Americans for the next generation, that's when we'll get back on course. And, and I think that in, on the Hill and in the Capitol in Austin, um, you can tell people like Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst who went from that establishment type you know, label to understanding what the big picture is and fighting like a pissed off dad. And so I think when, when people on the Hill realize that this is bigger than them, it's bigger than their job, it's bigger than, than the thing that they can, the piece of legislation that they can put forth that's going to save us, it's bigger than them, that's when it gets back to conservatism. Hey, Ann Stone, a longtime conservative and Republican activist. Don't even want to say how long, uh, but I was a floor manager for Reagan in 76, if wow. that gives you an idea. Uh, been around so a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're on the same team on many things. Not everything today, but most things. A um, couple of points, things I want to throw out, see what, you, what your reaction is. It's interesting, sitting here, the men, the women, segregation, it's okay. I know, I was like, what's up uh, with this? Mix it's, up. it's very interesting. But also, the temperament and the tone is very different here versus there. The uh, outrage, 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 and outrage, eh, not so much. Uh, maybe targeted, maybe done a little differently. It's, it's very much gender difference, uh, at least for sitting here watching the panel. It's been kind of fun. Um, but I do want to say outrage for the sake of outrage or outrage ongoing energizes the base, doesn't get you that much beyond. 
women don't listen to you. When you start screaming, we ain't listening. Sorry, doesn't matter what you're saying. We stop. And that's one of the problems we have. Right now, Republicans and conservatives are, are viewed as being obstructionist, angry, radical, uh, screaming, um, contrary, with no positive ideas. We know that's wrong but we spend so much time yelling that people can't hear us. If you want to get people to go beyond our base and join with us, first rule of any kind of change, you have to make people uncomfortable in what they know. And what they think of us is that picture. So at the risk of having you throw something at me, <clears throat> you all should be taking the lead in sitting down with Boehner maybe having Bill come in and mediate or having the Search for Common Ground people come in and mediate between the factions and the party. Stop having conservatives eat their young in public and cannibalize each other. You're, I'll tell you, beyond the base, that's killing us. It's killing us. You know, we don't have any solutions. We can't even deal with ourselves. And yes, you have a right to be angry. And yes, some of the anger got stuff done you wanted. It's not going to be successful, but it got, at least got the stuff considered. Sit down, talk together, figure it out, figure out where there is common ground, because there is a lot of it, and start speaking respectfully each of each other. I mean, the leadership needs to be more respectful of the Tea Party and, and other insurgent groups, and the insurgents need to be more respectful of, of leadership. We talked this morning about the fact nobody cuts Boehner a break. They don't even talk about a lot of the great institutional things he's done, like no earmarks, uh, like regular order, um, like cutting 15% of his budget, which he didn't have to do and did it without pain. You know, there's tons of things that they've done, and there's other institutional reforms they want to make while they have control that will have far-reaching effects into the future, but they're spending so much time protecting their rear ends and worrying about being primaried and having people scream at them, the other stuff isn't getting done. It's time for us to figure out how we work together. Be angry, go to the table angry, bring your concerns, but we've got to come up with a way forward or the other side will continue to win because the mom and pops out there are going to be too afraid to put us in charge because they can't hear us because we're screaming. By the way, out outrage, outrage, outrage is not about raising your voice and not about screaming. It's not about treating people with disrespect. I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back. But it to, comes across that way. I want to go back. I want to go back to Sunday. Sunday is 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 is. That's when bad. Someone, that's very bad. But that's endemic. It's okay? very bad. And that should be at the table. That should be the a consideration grassroots at the table. libertarian movement. You, you are buying into a left-wing meme, okay? And that meme is, that I, th I believe, I be that meme's dead wrong. We are winning. Look in Colorado on the cultural issues on guns. We're not winning overall. We're winning in targeted. We are when winning. When it comes to we guns, win. we'll always win. We are winning. We have, we ha we are on the right, we're on the right we'll side. We're on the right side culturally on, on guns. guns. We'll we're always win on that, no, yes. No, no. That's but by the way. By the way, yeah, by the way, a long time. By the way, one of the women. biggest groups ever to coming on our side is is is, yeah. is women. Yeah. Guns is a major cultural issue. Right. Okay. We're winning on issues about the budget, about spending. You can start to see that. Go but this whole thing about Obamacare. The one thing Obamacare now is horribly unpopular and going to become more unpopular. And one of the reasons was to get, get this message out, to do all the rallies, etc. Had people start to look really at Obamacare across the board on Syria. Across the board, we are winning on these issues. And by the way, it doesn't take, I didn't say you yell at people, and you don't scream at people, and you don't denigrate people, but you are absolutely rock solid, firm in your principles. You just made yes. all the stuff you talk about. And Boehner, you should. By the way, you I can't the believe anybody would bring, t uh, bring uh, um, earmarks and banner. That was forced by a group called Ending Spending, f funded by Joe Ricketts, a grassroots group that went out and actually, they're the guys that brought, and Brian Baker and these guys, they're the ones that brought. Uh, earmarks to an end. So across the board, you're seeing grassroots organizations are empowered and, and they're winning. Okay, Except so, they did so that right now what, what, we're, what we're seeing here, I think it's fairly clear, is that the establishment, it, people are getting uncomfortable. There's a lot of change. I mean, this is a dynamic time in American history, dynamic in the, in the conservative movement. Um, I mean, two years ago, the word libertarian, I think would be fair to say, would probably not have been mentioned. It's probably been mentioned 50 times today. Right. That's important. That's a huge change in what's going on in Washington. And it has profound 
potential impact. But I, as a follow-up, well, do you really think that we should continue to fight in public like this? Do you really absolutely. think that's going to lead to, absolutely. to future it's necessary. victories? It's necessary. Well, it's then absolutely. you're speaking we're, to we're, half we're, the population because the we're, women we're, aren't going to come We're going to have to agree to disagree. We're, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this point. The Tea Party movement, the Tea Party movement is a movement driven. The Tea Party movement is a movement driven by women. It's driven by engaged women. And they are at the forefront of this populist movement. So don't say we're, we're not going to lose, lose women. Women are at the forefront of this movement. In fact, women, I believe, are the ones that are driving the grassroots in the populist movement. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Brittany. I just want to say something really quickly. Um, you touched on they can't hear us because we're screaming so loudly. And I cannot tell you how many times I have been approached by young minorities in particular who say, well, I don't necessarily like Obamacare, but I don't know what the Republicans are offering. Or I don't like the, you know, Im the left-wing immigration idea, but, you know, Ted Cruz, you know, he's, he's, he seems to have really strong opinions on immigration, but he's not putting forth his own legislation. Or name any issue. It's, I don't really like what the Democrats are doing, but I don't know what the Republicans are doing. They don't seem to be doing anything because all they're hearing is a screaming. And that's, that's, uh, you hit the nail on the head. That's all I hear from, from people in Texas, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania. I can name these people all day long. They are doing great things and getting no credit for it. Well, again, the Ron Paul brought in a, a bunch of pe a group of new young people, young people, um, much more ethnically and philosophically diverse than, than the typical Republican candidate. Amen. Uh, we had 13,000 of them for, for a day-long rally in Tampa last, last year, the, the Sunday before the convention started. It was a wonderful thing, and it was all mostly very positive speeches a very positive message. We came out there, we went to the convention, and we got kicked in the teeth, the door slammed in our face, and we were told, we don't want you to participate in this party. We want your votes, but we don't want you to take leadership roles. We don't like you because you're, because you're new. We're gonna kick you out of the party, and that's wrong, but that's the, that's the history. And then you talk about that with Republicans, instead of doing op-ed on what's wrong with Obamacare, and instead of talking to people like Lori and people at Cato and Heritage about, What's some good ideas that we can put up with health care to replace Obama with? Because the second R, remember, was replace. Uh, they're, um, they're doing op-ed research on Ted Cruz. And I, I laugh because it just occurred to me how absolutely ridiculous it is for them to spend donor money that they probably got from conservative donors to do op-ed research on a conservative senator. For the, for the record, and, and this, this is, you know, we're, we're right here around Virginia, and forgive me, I'm going to kind of like bring it to Virginia here for a second. Um, I mean, it's also worth noting that Bill Bowling, uh, who was the lieutenant governor uh, mm. for Virginia, who was passed over for, for governor for Ken Cuccinelli, came out and support, basically denigrated the, the, uh, the, you know, Ken Cuccinelli who's running for governor of the Republic. I mean, this is the sitting lieutenant governor. Right. So that, there's, that's it's, it's an incredibly important point because that race, I believe, will be determined by enough of the grassroots being turned off and going to a libertarian candidate who's really not really running much. I mean, he's, he's out talking to people. Eight, is paid, polling at eight to ten percent. Some polls is that the grassroots and a lot of people are feeling so much frustration with the establishment and how they and that's with Ken Cuccinelli, who's Ken Cuccinelli is a great cause conservative and a terrific guy. I, I really think. The yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Okay. One last question. Thanks. Uh, Nigel Ashford, I'm with the Institute of Humane Studies. We're a libertarian educational organization for students and young people. Uh, Bill's paper identified two key demographics, youth and Hispanics. Young people tend to be socially liberal, especially on things like gay marriage. Hispanics tend to be socially conservative on things like gay marriage. Uh, now, I'm hoping that young Hispanics will become more socially liberal, like other young people, but I might be wrong. How do we talk about social issues in a way that will appeal both to young people and to Hispanics? All right, that teed it up. Yeah, go. <laughs> um, actually, a poll was released not too long ago, and I forgive me, I forget the name, but it showed that the longer that Hispanics are away from their birth country or generationally removed, they become more socially liberal. So what you're seeing is that today's young Hispanics are becoming more socially liberal. You're seeing um, a lot of gay movement, uh, a gay rights movement activists in the young Hispanic community. Um, you're seeing you're seeing a lot of that. Uh, 
I'm the Libre Initiative. We only work with economic issues, so we don't really talk about social issues unless it somehow we tie it directly back to Smart economic money. issues. So, um, but what we're seeing again is a lot of the young Hispanics. This is the biggest. The biggest problem is one: they don't know what, where we stand. They don't know where libertarians or conservatives stand on issues. They hear a lot of buzzwords, and a lot of them are angry, and they don't like that. Other than that, we're not getting our message through. They don't know what end the Fed means a lot of the time. No, a lot of, a lot of people, people don't know what end the Fed means. A lot of people don't uh, understand the concept. <laughs> uh, but that's a, like, that's a buzz phrase that we throw around all the time. Um, people don't understand the implications of property rights. Of, of limited government. And so what we're trying to do is go in and again, you have to make it relevant on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to show how some policy is going to affect them every single day in order for them to care about it. Um, as far as the social issues, like I said, they're, they're becoming more liberal, for better or worse, depending on where you stand on that. Um, but I think the, the key here to reach young people and Hispanics is through the message of economic freedom but also, we need to make sure, I, I know some of my other panelists disagree with me on this, but messaging is really important. Yes. We don't need to change our principles. I've said this, I think, four times now on this panel. Stand by your principles, don't water them down. But the messaging is important. It really is. If I go to Hillsdale and I talk about ending the Fed, it's going to be a lot different than if I'm going to University of Texas El Paso. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's just something Is that's, there a difference between those two schools? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I would say, the. Definitely work for economic freedom. Again, Hispanics very entrepreneurial by spirit. A lot of the reason our family came here. Why? Start businesses, more economic opportunity. If we show that the economic opportunity is leaving and that we're becoming more like the countries of Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, you're going to get the attention. Again, Hispanics start businesses at three times the national average. I think Hispanic women start businesses at six times the national average. So these are issues that sincerely affect young Hispanics. Median voting age for Hispanics, 27. Median voting age for whites, 42. We're a young demographic, so the message of liberty and economic freedom is definitely the way to go. We just need to figure out the packaging and the messaging. Excellent. I, what we're going to do is just briefly, I want to go down the line here and just uh, let you guys have some parting shots and uh, some parting ideas and something you want to, you know, want us to remember, um, you know, as you as you leave. So, Alex. Well, and, and just to kind of tap into what what you were saying, as a you know socially conservative Texas mom, um, that's between my family and I and our local community. When you have these big initiatives, you know, of, of the gay rights movement and, and they're, they're making it a social issue and we're trying to figure out how to, you know, not be seen as the wrong, on the wrong side. I think that goes down to a, a family issue and when you when you take it down local um, and you have moms and dads and grandparents uh, talking about these issues in the family, I think it's going to take care of that, that issue instead of letting the left drive the narrative that all, all the right cares about are these social issues. So take a hold of the narrative. I think that these kind of panel discussions are, are huge. But I also think it would be great to take it from here into small communities and, and bring in uh, people like Lori from the Hill so that, that they can put a name, <laughs> you know, a face with these people. Because I think that that's what, you know, I'm behind my computer in Texas. I stay away from here. And so <laughs> um, I think when you bring it into reality that these are people that are trying to make a difference and create those relationship, um, there's huge opportunity. We just have to take it. Brittany. Um, I think my parting words would be, oh, where to start? Uh, <laughs> um, okay, the young, you know, we're here talking about the future of conservatism. The future of conservatism is very similar to, the, hopefully, the future of America, um, in that I hope it will still be around the conservative movement. Um, America's browning. That's just reality. Um, and we need to learn how to convey our principles and expand the base. That's, I mean, we can squabble all day and I love having policy discussions. I, they're immensely important. They're extremely important. But if there's only five people discussing these policy ideas while the rest of the country is voting, you know, leftist, then they don't really do as much good, do they? So I think 
you know, you kind of talked about everyone has their own part to play. I think it's very important that we recognize that and that we support each other. Um, moving forward, we need to hone our message. Yes, stand by our principles. We also need to learn how to communicate it more effectively. Uh, we're not going anywhere if we don't learn how to communicate it. And the constant f fighting that's taking place on the public stage, it's so difficult to deal with. I'll never forget the one day I was mentoring, I mentor um, this group called Latinas Leading Tomorrow in, in Virginia. And I go to their after school programs and I'll speak about issues in Virginia affecting them and like going to college, majoring, things like that. And you know, they, they're just asking, the one woman was like, you know, the one girl, Stephanie, she asked me, you know, where do you stand politically? You know, I might go into political science. And I, I told her, you know, I'm a conservative and this is what I believe. And she's like, but Miss Brittany, you're Hispanic. How can you be a conservative? They hate us. They want us. They think we're all from Mexico and that we should all go back. And I was just like, oh, no. Where did you hear that? But that message occurs all the time. Where and did she says she hears it um, on the news. You hear it from, or um, let's see, pundits. Uh, she's mentioned. She mentioned that she heard. Who is it from? I don't I mean, know, it's I think, almost built into the message at this yeah, point. Yeah, like know? it's it's. But I would I would venture to say I, I encourage everyone if you've got a, a child or grandchild or a niece or a nephew, go look at their curriculum that they're learning in school, because the messaging is coming in from through their curriculum. A long course right. is going to make it worse. Yes. All right, Lori. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. Do you have anything? I just want. I guess. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll find. I'll briefly end on this. Um, get involved. Um, yes. You know, I was part of the. You know, I go to Young Republicans meetings occasionally, not to yet knock the Young Republicans. I think they could be a very great organization. But I think a lot of times conservatives get um, really wrapped up in having like happy hours okay. as opposed to actually like going out and There's talking value to people. To that. <laughs> <laughs> and who loves? Who doesn't love a great happy hour? But at the same time, when you're basically a drinking club, you're, we're not really doing much for the communities. <laughs> and as far as the messaging, I know this is going to get me some blowbacks, but it's you know it's the end of the panel. So um, there are a lot of <laughs> pundits out there who do more harm to the conservative movement than good. And I'm going to go ahead and say Michelle Malkin, Ann Coulter, Rush Limbaugh, sometimes while they have some really great points, and I agree with them probably 98% of the time on issues, when you hear tidbits of Rush Limbaugh dropped the N-bomb on his radio show, yeah. Or Michelle Malkin screaming shamnesty, shamnesty. You know, Marco Rubio is the worst enemy to the conservative movement ever. Like, it's not helpful. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, that kind of makes my job harder for one. But two, it just doesn't help the conservative movement. And that's kind of what I was referring to about the selling outrage for profit. Is sometimes we scream things because we know it'll rile up the base and they'll give us money. All and right. That's my excellent. Yeah, Lord. I mean, I just have to meet like double everything that she just said. Um, I think we're in complete agreement. I mean, I think what I find mo most frustrating about today um, and the narrative, both in Washington and around the country, is that, you know, I, I mean, I used to be liberal, right? I used to think that the government's, you know, the government created, I'm from Macon, Georgia, right? We have 26% single motherhood rate, a 27% poverty rate, 40% graduation rate in our public schools. These were government created problems by, you know, segregation, Jim Crow law, all sorts of things, right? And in my mind, that meant that the government should fix the problems because the <laughs> government created the problems. And it, you know, it took some soul searching and a lot of, um, you know, honest thinking before I realized that really what you want is the most efficient actor to solve a problem, right? And the most efficient actor is very, very seldom going to be the government. And I think that we all agree on that, whether you're a conservative or a libertarian. And I think that the majority of the country actually does agree with that, whether they realize it or not. You know, there's all sorts of polling data that tells you that, you know, people think that problems should be solved at the community level. People are skeptical of government's ability to, you know, save their child's education or, you know, save the um, people living in poverty in their community. Yet they continually go to government for the answer. Um, and I think a lot of it does have to do um, both with sort of just the growth of state over time and we become more comfortable with it, um, but also a lot of today has to do with the negative messaging and the infighting. And, you know, conservatarianism should be this big tent. We do have the answer for Hispanics. We do have the answer for young people. We do have the answer for women who, you know, are being told continually to lean in, lean in. This is the only message you get from the left. But that's, like, not really what women want. We want to just make our own choices, have children, not have children, go to work, don't go to work, right? Like, the left is selling a bill of goods that women don't want, Hispanics don't want, and young people don't want. 
Um, but I think that we get so focused on this is what that, you know, this is therefore the solution we have to advocate for that we lose a ton of those people because we lose the respect for their unique individual circumstances. And that's what conservatism is supposed to be about, right? Like it's supposed to be about the individual, yet we don't want to listen to so many individuals from different circumstances who may be able to add something to the policy community. Um, so I think that we need to, we do need, we need to reach out more, we need to focus more, we need to, you know, practice messaging to, you know, different, um, different groups. You know, the good thing about technology today, like I said earlier, is you can send, a, I got tailored messages all the time from Barack Obama at exactly when I was going to read it with exactly what I wanted to read. And we don't really do that in the conservative movement because we don't really care what a lot of people want to read, honestly. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of our biggest problems. And hopefully, I do think there are positive signs. We've talked about them today that that is changing. This is just what we need to emphasize going forward. Um, I want to begin by apologizing if, there's, if you've noticed me holding my black my phone and just checking it and just right now sending an email. It's because I was waiting for something from my boss. and. He just sent an email saying, well, Norm's probably still on his panel. And I said, Bexie, about to deliver closing remarks. So he's probably expecting me to be very quick with these, which is good for you. Um, I would say that I actually agree with a lot of what's been said by the, the ladies on the panel. Um, I think that uh, as, my, as uh, many of the things that I learned from Ron Paul and working in, with him and watching the growth of, of the liberty movement through his, uh, through his efforts was that liberty does bring people together. The message of liberty, I've seen it, 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 it attracts people from various backgrounds, from various uh, religious and ethnicities. You, you, we, you need to have the courage, though, to actually believe that liberty works, to believe in, in freedom, to believe in the, those core values. Um, you, need, you do need to figure out how do you sell it. Um, I think that, no offense, Brittany, but the end the Fed message actually is powerful because there is a sense in this country that things are, things are wrong and that institutions like the Federal Reserve are the, are the, epi the epiphany or of crony capitalism. And that's something that, 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 that is a message that actually does bring people together. The cronyism, the corporatism, um, it's a problem for the Republican Party because there are too many in the, in the establishment of the Republican Party. And I know that to talk about the Republican establishment is an instant mind closer to a lot, to unfortunately a lot of people in this town, but, that, but who are still, are still welded to, to, the, to programs like the farm programs, like XM, like the, like the Fed itself. Um, but that is, that is one thing that we can do to, to attract people. I think you, you, we need to be principled, uh, unwielding on our principles, but flexible in strategy, flexible in how we sell our principles. We need to go to communities where we haven't always gone, and we need to talk to them about our ideas and tell them directly, these, are, these ideas will work better for you because you're getting a raw deal from the other side, and part of it is our fault because we haven't come to you in the past, but we're coming to you now. The way Senator Rand Paul went to um, Howard University and was the first Republican to show up there Maybe since Frederick Douglass, I don't know, but it's, it's been a long time. Um, and I think that we also do need to be, to be willing to not eat our own in public, but we also need to be willing to stand up to the GOP establishment, because that's part of establishing street cred, is to say that we're not just willing to fight Barack Obama but we're all, and Harry Reid but we're all, and Nancy Pelosi, but we're also willing to fight John Boehner and Eric Cantor. And, um, uh, Lindsey Graham and John McCain when they, when, when they don't adhere to our principles. So it is about principle over party because that's, I, th I think that's very important to attracting mil millennials. Um, we're on the right side of history. Don't believe the mainstream media. Don't believe the establishment. Do not believe the permanent political class. We are on the right side of history. Advances in technology now make it possible for millennials to actually have control of their lives. Okay, and that's what we offer at the end of the day. And this is gonna be a very nasty, long, protracted fight. There is a permanent political class in this city that dominates it, and by that dominates the country. And there is a dedicated group of libertarians and grassroots conservatives and Tea Party conservatives and limited government conservatives that are here to destroy that. And that is going to be ugly, tough, 
work. That's just the reality of it. People are not going to give up an aristocracy willingly. And we're on the right side of history, and victory begets victory. If you look closely at what is going on and why the second Obama term is the disaster, is because we're winning. And you can look at virtually any policy, and we're winning, and we're going to continue to win. Thanks. All right. Well, I will say this. A couple of thoughts before we go. Um, yeah, there's, 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 there's a lot of conflict, obviously, and that is exactly why I felt like this panel was so important, and we got the wonderful people we, we have this afternoon to speak their minds. I'm very thankful for that. Um, I believe, yeah, there, there is a lot of conflict. Part of conflict is diplomacy, very important part of that, getting things done. Dealing with, uh, you know, there's, there's often warfare going on, and there's often another front, a quiet front, where uh, decent human beings who may differ on points, uh, on significant points that they will never come together on, can still communicate with one another, and that is vital to a constitutional republic such as we have today. Um, I want to thank the audience for, for coming out and, and taking the time uh, to engage uh, in this endeavor. And I want to thank um, our panel. You guys were fantastic. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Thank you again. I just want to take a, take a minute uh, uh, to close as well. Um, we, I think that, um, that, that outrage is a legitimate part of the political process. Optimism is a legitimate part as well. Outrage is the sugar to the movement. It does power short-term bursts. Uh, but I find that outrage in the progressive movement uh, prevents that movement from acknowledging its failures and from opening, and ex opening its minds to how to actually accomplish some of the worthy objectives that it sets forth for itself. And then it becomes intellectually dishonest about its path. The same I see on the right very often, that outrage is politically pragmatic and does advance things, but it's the sugar, the nutrient is optimism. And uh, uh, we have a majority now, for the first time in, in a couple of generations, a majority of young Hispanics and women who embrace the principles that we've talked about today as fundamental to conservatism, but who still reject the Republican Party and often the conservative movement because they don't see it as a part of their own. And I think it's important that we open our minds to the potential that the way we're using outrage undermines the success of the movement in the long run. We have to combine outrage with optimism, with having a positive agenda, and making sure that we have someone at the top of the ticket that represents that positive agenda. We, we, know, we, can, you know, we know what the vice presidential uh, slot is for. Uh, that person can be, the, uh, can be the, uh, the, the carrier of the outrage, but we need a positive agenda. If we have a positive agenda, then uh, 2016, 2020 are going to be easy. If we don't, I don't see us, I don't see us winning. Thank you very much. Please stay in touch with Future 500. If you're interested in the progress of this initiative, we want to work with you uh, and stay with us, and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.